Hi there. Welcome to my home office. This is where I'm going to be conducting a whole series of very short videos for our class for you to watch at home before class so that you can get some idea about the things that we're going to be talking about and discussing in class in depth because this is, as I've probably already told you, a pretty interactive class. There'll be a lot of activities for us to do. You're going to have a great time, have a lot of fun, and we're going to learn a lot. And uh, a lot of that is going to be picked up in these mini lectures. And we're going to get the first one going right now. Have fun. This mini lecture will introduce you to some of the core concepts we'll be covering in this course, Canadian Art After 1945. A key objective for us is to define which narratives matter to historians of Canadian art and which themes and ideas matter to the artists producing the art that was made in Canada after 1945. So we find ourselves asking this question, what is the Canadian narrative or narratives in art? If we are going to ask what are the dominant narratives, we'll also need to ask what are the marginal ones? Who gets to determine what those narratives are and what they say about us as Canadians, both past and present? Who are the privileged players in the art market? Uh, is another question we should be asking. Now, it's no mystery that we're looking at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa, um, built around 1984, to house the nation's permanent collection. Who decided what art belonged in there? How much of that art tells the story of the struggle of settling the land in Canada, the alienating and unforgiving landscape? Does that narrative sound familiar? Well, we can ask how this story of the harsh and beautiful land was brought into the 20th century. We should be asking that. In part, um, abstraction has something to do with it. So we're looking here at Lauren Harris's painting of a glacier um, and a lake and a mountain. The simplified lines and the broad, almost empty patches of fields of color are abstract. So do you feel a kind of quiet, almost spiritual stillness to the tone? We all know by now that the uh, group of seven um, have held a dominant position in the telling of the Canadian story of art and identity. But we don't typically think of them as modern artists, and often we don't think of them as abstract artists. Harris however, seems to be pushing a boundary, reacting to the impressionistic landscape of loose brushwork typically associated with other members. Let's not forget that he came from a wealthy family, needing not to work at the Grip Graphic Art Company, where most of the other group of seven artists worked and met. So, maybe he could afford to be a little more experimental than the others. Um, I'd like to know what you think. The next generation of artists in Canada were reacting even more negatively to the impressionistic style of European painting that was, by the early 20th century, considered mainstream. At least no longer avant-garde. Artists like John Lyman, whose painting of Jory Smith, shown here, um, were trained outside of Canada. He was in Paris. Lyman was instrumental in setting up the Canadian Art Society, however, when he did come back. Um, and they were a group whose members tended to believe that all objects represented in paintings, whether that's portraits or landscapes or a bowl of fruit, were equally important. And this was a big change in thinking about subject matter, as it, um, if the typical hierarchy that put historical and religious subjects at the top and still life and genre scenes at the bottom was going to be disrupted. So uh, I'd like to know what you think the Canadian Art Society and Lyman were trying to say. And that's something that we should try to talk about in class. Perhaps that painted subjects were simply information represented in paint. That's possible. Here, um, look at a different group. The Beaver Hall Hill group from Ontario, uh, made up exclusively of female painters, who painted in, um, in and around the 1920s. They, um, though the ideas that they had about the alienating land were more closely matched to the group of seven, the Beaver Hall Hill group was doing something similar to what the Canadian Art Society was doing. That is, 
they were using abstraction. Um, they were reducing subjects to a pure kind of information. Now let's look at another artist who experiments with abstraction, urban themes, and painterly information um, is pretty apparent. And this was the artist David Milne. He was a Canadian artist, uh, or a Canadian-born artist, who lived a large portion of his adult life in New York City. And though he died young and did not really uh, live to reap the financial rewards of his success, he's considered a significant influence on the development of modern art in Canada. Look at how he reduces the subject to a series of simple lines, almost a Morris code of dots and dashes, with plenty of white space suggesting snow. Uh, but wait, much of the white space is actually bare canvas. And that's a pretty experimental affront to the idea of the finished, or so-called finished, painting. And I'd like to know if you agree. Now, by the mid-20th century, around the time when our course timeline actually starts, we can easily find artists like Guido Molinari working in pure, or you might call geometric, abstraction. Um, we'll see him again later in the course when we start talking about automatism and the Quebec scene. His work is angular, hard-edged, and crisp, um, using vibrant color. Here we're looking uh, at a little bit of his later work from about 1976. Uh, we might call it op or optical art. But we're looking at it to drive home the idea that artists were not necessarily always forward-looking, like we might like to think, but they were also reacting to the past. Uh, we'll see in this class how important documents like Refu Global shown here, reacted really harshly and very negatively to tradition in Canada. So they're reacting to the past. Um, they almost single-handedly ushered in a trend that followed abstraction called non-objective painting, at least in Canada. If abstraction reduces subjects to its bare essentials, then non-objective painting rejects the idea of subject at all. If Molinari's painting um, is it non-objective or is it abstraction? If you guessed abstraction, I think you'd be correct. Why? Because it shows familiar and distinctive shapes, lines, maybe triangles, um, but he's definitely reacting to, uh, very negatively, to the sentimentalism of the group of seven landscapes. Uh, and when we start to look at Refu Global, you'll see why. The naturalism of European painterly style is also being negatively reacted to, and he's siding much more closely with the New York artists such as Rothko or Jackson Pollock, uh, or, in this case, shown here, Barnett Newman. Uh, Newman was considered one of the most important painters in the U.S. Uh, in the 1950s uh, and 60s, and he challenged the idea of having subject matter in painting. He wasn't alone. Pollock did it too. So did Rothko, as I mentioned. Uh, but he was definitely a major player. Now, while you're thinking about who constructed the story that he was one of the great American painters, let's come back to the idea of Canadian narratives and narrative makers. Why do we privilege some stories over others? The story of this painting that we're looking at makes the point uh, quite nicely, I think. The painting is by Newman, and it's called Voice of Fire. Maybe it's abstract, maybe it's non-objective. In this case, um, that's not the point. The point is that it was really controversial. Uh, in the late 1980s, or mid-1980s, the National Gallery of Canada purchased this painting for about $1.8 million, and uh, the public reacted very negatively, and so did the press. There was criticism over paying so much for the painting that there were only two colors and three stripes. Uh, and, but frankly, people had forgotten not only how important Newman was um, to abstract and non-objective painting, um, but they also didn't recognize that the painting itself had hung in the U.S. pavilion of Expo 67 in Montreal. That was an event that was a major uh, happening in Canada that introduced 
Canadian culture to an international audience. So it was a pretty big deal. So we're back to this idea that telling the national narrative depends on what stories we include and what stories we exclude. What's in the National Gallery and what's not. So I'd like you, before class, to go to the National Gallery website um, and look at our permanent collection or some of it. What stories do these artworks tell about us and about Canada? See you in class.